Welcome back. Thank you for joining us on the GHT Overland Podcast. This is where you get the greatest interviews and insights from overland travelers around the globe, learning from their stories and experiences as we interview overlanders from places like Australia, Africa, the Americas, Pakistan, and today, Canada. You will learn the basics to the advanced in overlanding, so buckle up and get ready for more adventure. I'm Chris. And I'm Lisa. This is part two with Ray Highland. Last week, we learned about the Palaxiax, to immerse yourself as a local and get out of the truck and immerse your senses in the environment you're in, which I thought was solid advice because we all get busy, you want to get somewhere and you don't stop to think to stop. Exactly. Like so much more than just seeing it from a window. Yeah. It reminds me of the advice we got. I apologize. I don't remember exactly which interview it was. Um, I think it was burned with a Bowden Sea Overlander. Safety wise, you don't want to drive at night, but as well, you don't want to drive at night because you miss all the scenery. So it's the same thing. Don't miss the good stuff <laughs> by getting in a hurry. That's what we're kind of getting out of. This week, you will want to buckle up as we cover border crossings, navigation, and all the finer details of Ray's overlanding setup, both for their London to Singapore trip, along with his current day setup. All right, are you ready? I'm ready. This is a really good one. Ray has a great story of a border crossing experience that, in my mind, was just epic. What did you think? My jaw dropped. Because I wanted to ask him, can I say it now? No. Oh. Let's get into the episode. <laughs> Border crossings will be tedious um, and confusing. And they're purposely set up to be tedious and confusing. And um, I think you just need to go into them with a sense of humor. And uh, and just go with the flow at the border. Don't expect it to go the way you think it should go. Don't don't look for any sense of efficiencies. Um, don't expect people to be polite. Don't expect anything to make sense. Um, and and just kind of run with it. And um, you know, and also give into local culture a little bit. I mean, there are, you know, there's there's a there's a huge subset of the overland community who says I will never ever make a bribe at any time on any trip um, which is awesome uh, and if those people want to spend 10 days sitting at the border somewhere um, more power to them um, but at the same time I mean I've I've been in situations where it's like okay this is really frustrating there's 10 pages of paperwork I don't speak the local language so I can't figure it out you know there's a there's a dude sitting here near the border and he's like you know for a hundred you know, 100 pesos or whatever it's going to be, I can sort out everything for you. And I'm like, okay, here you go. You know, for the for the yeah. equivalent of 20 bucks, and I'm through the border yeah. in an hour, um, and I see people who've been camping there, you know, and then, you know, they, they go back into town to buy provisions. I'm like, yeah, we're, we'll, we'll take the easy way out. Thank you. Yep. So, um, I so I think, you know, so, you know, the, but at the same time, I mean, it's not like you're just throwing money around when you're going through a border. You just, you just need to be patient. You need to understand what the process is, and uh, and just recognize that sometimes you're going to need a little bit of help, um, and and sometimes there's an expectation for a little bit of, you know, as as some countries call it, a little bit of tea money. Um, you know, why don't you buy me a cup of tea, and I'll see if I can make this work a little faster for you, sir. Um, you know, so I'm not saying that you should do it one way or the other, and and we've kind of gone with both approaches. I think you know, just when you when you go through a border, go in with an open mind and a relaxed attitude, and and don't be too fixed or rigid in your thinking. Just kind of go, all right, let's just take a look at this and see. We'll do what we need to do to get through this as painlessly as possible. Any specific border crossings that stand out to you? The crossing from Turkey into Iran. Uh, was interesting because we were approaching the border coming out of Dogbayezit in um, 
in northern uh, northeastern Iran, or sorry, in Turkey, um, heading towards the the border with Iran, and we ran into a lineup of trucks um, that were sitting waiting for the border to open, and the lineup of trucks was was maybe four or five miles long. Oh wow! Um, there were literally thousands of trucks, and so we were like, well, I guess this is a lineup for the border. And we kind of pulled in, and a and a couple of truck drivers saw us, and they they waved us forward. They said, no, no, you guys can go up up ahead and so but the the whole road was blocked with trucks and so we ended up driving over the concrete onto the grassy meridian um in the center of the highway and we drove up the grass for like five miles past all these trucks and and we had to drive around obstacles at one point we clipped a truck and the driver was really gracious he just kind of shook his head and <laughs> laughed at us and moved us on and um and when we got up to the border we we found a local fixer and, you know, he, he took us through this process that we never, ever would have figured out on our own, um, you know, and, and to the point where, like, just to, to get the 20 different people who needed to sign and stamp our various forms, um, you know, not speaking Farsi, I mean, I, I would never have figured out how to, or Persian, you know, how to, how to get this done. And, and at points, like, I was following this guy through the kitchens in the restaurant to get the backdoor access to the room of a particular um, person that needed to stamp a form, you know what I mean? And, and there was people camped out in front of his office waiting for him, like, you know, dozens of people deep. And he was, like, in his office having lunch. And, like, we, we, we went through the kitchens and then into the back alley and then, like, knocked on his window, you know what I mean, to, to kind of get stuff done. Oh, that's great. And uh, so, you know, it's just that whole process of, of getting through the border was, was you know, something I never would have been able to make up even. It was just, it was pretty crazy. And I came back to the car and, and I said to my wife and my kids, I said, you know, we're so glad we found this fixture guy because there's absolutely no way we would have been able to figure out this process on our own. Yeah, you might have been camped was, there for two weeks. Oh, yeah. And then I was explaining the process to the rest of the family, and they were just killing themselves laughing. They're like, <laughs> and they went where? So, yeah. Any specific safety planning you do or tips you can provide our listeners on safety and security? Um, I think safety and security are two different things. One is, you know, security, make sure that you only bring something that you're happy to lose on a trip. Um, so if something is really, really precious to you, leave it at home. Um, you know, so if, if uh, you know, I, I see people, they're going out and they're wearing their fancy Rolex watch, you know, on a, on a trip. And I'm wearing my $25 Timex and I'm pretty happy with that. Um, and you know, the same thing with your gear. If, if you have a piece of gear, which is literally too precious to lose, then don't take it somewhere obscure. Um, you know, carry your, carry your stuff with you, you know, bring, bring small enough stuff that you can leave the truck and bring it with you. So like, you know, instead of bringing a, a huge camera bag with, you know, multiple lenses, I brought a little portable Fuji X20 with me on that trip. And that was, that was my go-to camera. Um, because when I'd walk away from the truck, you know, we'd bring your passports and your money and your camera and your laptop uh, all in a little handbag and you're good to go. Um, you know, and so you're not really worried about how secure the vehicle is. I mean, you know, and that's, that's obviously if you're driving an earth roamer, it's a different approach, right? Mm -hmm. But, uh, for our little, our little series truck, that was it. And then as far as, um, safety goes, you know, I think the, the thing to recognize the number one danger to overlanders is motor vehicle accidents, whether caused by yourself or caused by somebody else. So, you know, make sure that you've got the best tires you can get. Um, make sure that you have a comprehensive first aid kit and make sure that you know how to use it. Um, I joined my local volunteer fire department. Um, and one of the reasons I did that was because they would take me through a comprehensive first responder medical training program. And so, you know, having gone through that training, I was really comfortable taking my kids and, and my family into into an area where if we did run into a medical emergency, I felt pretty comfortable that I'd be able to handle it. And then my kids have kids have taken, you know, fairly advanced first aid for their for their age because they're all trained as lifeguards. Um, so, you know, the the same thing. I mean, you know, make sure you have a good first aid kit with you. Make sure you know how to use it. So, okay. yeah. Very good. How do you manage changing currency as you travel through these different countries? Um, 
honestly, changing currency is really easy. Is it? Every okay. border you go to, you'll find a money changer, and you can just ask around. Never, never change money. The banks they don't give you very good rates. And the only time somebody ever tried to pickpocket me on my entire trip was in a bank. Um, <laughs> oh, but. Uh, yeah, standing in a bank teller line up in India. But um, yeah, near near the borders, you'll find these independent money changers, and they always have uh, they always have the best rates. And you just basically you know figure out what the rate is ahead of time, um, go to the money changer, and and make sure there's two of you, um, because there are stories and you know there are instances where where you know shady people at money changers will try to rip you off. They'll they'll try to do a little sleight of hand, or they'll. They'll show you their money. They'll count it out. They set it below the counter, and then they pick up a different stack and hand it to you, or whatever. You know what I mean? That that kind of stuff happens around the world, whether you're at home or whether you're on a trip. Um, so you, if you are going to convert a large amount of money, um, make sure there's a second person with you who can kind of help you keep track of everything. Um, you know, just an extra pair of eyes. So if if there's a distraction in the room, one person's always watching the money. But honestly, these days you don't really need to carry a lot of cash. Um, Everywhere we went to, ATM cards, debit cards, credit cards, all work. Um, credit cards are going to give you pretty much the best rate. As long as you get a credit card before you go internationally traveling, that doesn't charge you um, foreign transaction fees. And there's lots of options from every credit card company. So get something that doesn't charge you foreign transaction fees, um, and they'll just charge you whatever the local rate is. And it's it's so much easier than carrying cash around. And then you can go to any ATM con- you know. ATM machine in any country and, and take out a couple of hundred bucks on your Visa card if you need to. So, you know, that that would be my way to go. Don't don't bring a lot of cash unless you're going to a country like Iran where they had, you know, they weren't connected when we went through to the international currency system because of the sanctions against the country. So, you know, for that country, we, we took out cash before we left um, Turkey. And, and we brought cash with us. But that that was pretty much the only one. Everything else, we just used our Visa card. Perfect. Okay, good. On navigation and communication, how do you make sure you know where you are and you don't get lost? Like, what is your current method of doing that? Uh, use my phone. Yeah, I mean, the, the Maps Me um, app, which I love. Um, I think it's a dollar to download all of the offline maps for any country in the world. And um, so a dollar per country. So, you know, we went through like 16 countries on our trip. So $16 worth of maps. And um, and it works just like Google Maps. I mean, you can you can uh, program your street address into it. It'll give you turn by turn directions to to where you want to go. It has topographic information um, and it uses local municipal and government data um, in its base layers. So it's, it's usually quite up to date and has a lot of comprehensive information on it. But the, the nice thing about that is is you can be in the middle of nowhere with no cell service and uh, you know with an iPhone with a built-in GPS function you can still know exactly where you are. And um, and then on our on our London to Singapore trip we also brought one of the Delorme inReach devices. Okay. And that was handy just I mean, we never needed it for an emergency, but it was nice to be able to send a note to my mom every once in a while to tell her where we were so she wouldn't worry. And also that that's a fun little device for, you know, posting onto Facebook if you want to and and um and sending and receiving emails. So, you know, I was I was still working on one client project um on my trip, so I was able to send and receive emails to my client, you know, every once in a while as required. I tried to unplug as much as I could for the trip, so Okay. Do you generally do uh, any sort of work during your overland trips? You know, I'm semi-retired. We we do a bunch of little consulting projects, and we we um, we have a series of events uh, that we manage in the summer times. So there's not a lot of work usually when we're traveling, but I mean, it's still nice to be able to keep in touch with people, um, yep. just in case somebody comes up with a with a question. Um, but yeah, we we don't we don't do a lot of work um, in general when we travel. Um, probably the most work we would do would be schoolwork because, you know, we homeschooled our kids up until last year. And so, you know, we would, we would bring some textbooks and stuff along and we would be, um, we'd be doing homeschooling when we'd be camped out. Okay. And on vehicle maintenance and repair, what would be your current pre-trip planning process? So you're confident in your vehicle that you take? Uh, I guess it depends on how remote you're going to be. 
Um, but I mean, for before any trip, obviously I'm going to check and change all the fluids, um, make sure my, my brakes and my tires are, are in great shape, um, make sure the steering is in great shape. I mean, you can, you can fix anything else on the trail, um, but if you have a catastrophic steering um, problem, you can't even tow the vehicle out. So that's the number one system you need to always be concerned about. Um, and, you know, other than that, I think just bring a few basic spares, which are appropriate to the vehicle, um, some fan belts. Um, and usually as far as spares go, I don't I don't bring a ton of spare parts with me usually for, for a trip, but I'll bring raw materials that I can use to make spares, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I'll bring lots of random nuts and bolts and big washers and, and, and small pieces of steel with holes randomly drilled in them so I can brace something or secure something or fix a bracket if something breaks and um i bring um the rescue tape um high pressure silicon tape which you can use to repair hoses in the field and that type of stuff so usually i'll just bring enough to uh, to make an emergency field repair and get us to another city so yeah it, it kind of depends on 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 where we're going how much um pre-trip maintenance we're going to do but i mean i I try to keep all of my vehicles um, well maintained on a on a daily basis. So, so everything is pretty much ready to just you know throw some food in and and hit the trail at a moment's notice. Okay. Do you carry one spare tire or two? I carry one spare, and then I carry a comprehensive tire repair kit, and I also carry an inner tube, appropriate to the size of whatever tires are on the vehicle that I'm in. So you can, in, a, in an emergency, like if you've got a bad, uh, badly torn sidewall, for example, you can stitch that closed and put a tube into a tubeless tire and that'll get you home. Perfect. Love it. So yeah. let's go through some onboard necessities real quick. How much fuel can you carry with you and how far does that take you? And let's do the, the trip you did from London to Singapore. Okay, so that truck had a single under seat fuel tank which was roughly 45 liters i think and that would allow me to drive for roughly 10 hours and uh, cuz it's a small 2 liter engine and then i carried two 20 liter jerry cans of fuel um on the front bumper and so you know kind of your old land rover style where you see a couple of jerry cans you know, you know on the on the two edges of the front bumpers um so yeah that was our that was our fuel system uh, i think on like day six or something like that of, of the trip the um the fuel gauge broke in that truck oh, perfect. and oh. so so we you know we were we i took a branch off of a tree on the side of the road and stripped the branches off of it and, or stripped the leaves off of it and i used to dip the tank every morning to see how much fuel we had um, but, but because we didn't have a fuel gauge, we were constantly forgetting about it and running out of fuel in the middle of cities and stuff. So we'd push it to the sidewalk and pull a jerry can off the front bumper and, and fill it back up. Awesome. Um, so yeah, so there were, there were a couple of areas, like there were parts of India and, um, and Northern Myanmar where fuel was pretty scarce. And so we, we picked up an extra fuel can for those legs. Um, so we had, I think three fuel cans with us that were full of petrol. Um, but I think only once or twice did we actually need to use all of that fuel to get between petrol stations. Um, most of the time, I mean, I, again, kind of like, like with food, anywhere that there are people, you can usually find fuel. So, and, uh, and in remote areas, a lot of developing remote areas, um, sometimes it's a little harder to find uh, gasoline. Um, but most of the time, gasoline is widely available, even in little villages, is because it's what all the scooters run off of. So okay. people with little tiny motorcycles will use gasoline, whereas you know diesel is is used just for the bigger transport trucks. So if you're if you're going through you know an industrial area, um, it might be easier to find diesel. But most of the time, in the remote areas, gasoline is easiest to find. Okay. And how did you manage water use? Like, how much water did you carry with you, and how did you make sure that it was purified and safe to drink? So we brought a 20-liter jerry can for water, and um, we had a couple of systems. We had a, a platypus um, family size water filter system, which we used, um, and then we also had some MSR um, filtration tablets. 
And so if we weren't 100% sure about the quality of the water we were getting, we would filter it and, uh, and drop a couple of filtration tabs in. And, and that, was, uh, that was a pretty easy um, setup. Very, very easy to manage okay. and, uh, and didn't take up a lot of space. Perfect. Did you or do you currently use either a solar or a generator? Mm, yeah, we use solar. We have, um, we have a setup from Overland Solar. Uh, in Washington State, and uh, it's it's really nice. Uh, I think it's 120 watts or something like that. It's basically a solar panel, which is the size of my, the windshield of my truck, and um, and I run that into the into the the main battery system. I just have a standard uh, twin battery system set up in the vehicles. So yeah, any not on the London to Singapore trip, but on the other vehicles we have, the more modern vehicles, we always we always run twin batteries in any of those vehicles. Okay. And uh, that combined with a, a good solar panel um, it gives you more than enough power. Perfect. And I know on the London to Singapore, you did not use a refrigerator. Do you currently use a refrigerator in your vehicle? I do. Um, I broke down this summer and picked up a Dometic um, 65 liter fridge, and and it's great. I mean, it's massive. Um, you know, it kind of takes up half the back of the the Range Rover, for example. Um, and at first, I was a little intimidated by just how big it was. But then after I I learned to embrace the the bigness of it, um, now I just throw everything into it, even stuff that doesn't need to be refrigerated. And that's actually kind of handy. So I can throw my ketchup and mustard and, you know, the, the beers that don't need to be cold right away. I can just throw everything in this huge cavernous fridge. And, uh, and it's nice because I only have to look in one location to find all of my food. Um, as opposed to you know, using a little cooler or a little fridge where you, okay, this is the stuff that needs to be cold today. And the stuff that doesn't need to be cold today can stay in a box for a couple of days. And, you know, and you're kind of, you're constantly playing the juggling act um, where you're loading stuff in and out of fridges, you know, to get it cold enough for when you need it to be cold. Um, with this big Dometic 65, I just throw everything into it and forget about it. That's got to be pretty handy. Yeah. yeah, it's super handy, <laughs> especially, you know, as a family of five. I mean, you know, it's it's great. You just you throw everything in the fridge. You don't worry about it. So, yeah, super handy and and no ice water to deal with and that kind of stuff. So, oh, yeah, we've 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 played the cooler game for, you know, ever. Yep. And uh, and, you know, I must be getting old because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really appreciating having this fridge now. Cool. Right. Any philanthropy or giving back that you do or any opportunities that you've seen that other overlanders should take a look at during their overland travels to do some good in the world? Um, you know, I, th I think that everybody has their own approach. Um, I know the Shapiro family uh, has a, and, and you might know um, Jay Shapiro and his wife Alice, um, but they have a, an organization called Do Good As You Go, and it's specifically targeting overlanders. And they have, they have, um, a program where you can you can sign out cameras and I think they have an adventure trailer and and a whole bunch of gear that overlanders can dip into to run like photography clinics and education programs and stuff like that with uh, with kids as you travel which is which is a lot of fun um, I know a lot of people basically just say I want to um, find local charities to work with um, for me personally, I'm a fellow of the Royal Canadian Geographic Society, and so one of the one of the obligations of a fellow is for us to um, interact with people around the world and just share knowledge. And so to try and to try and find local people and understand, you know, the the unique bits of culture and local geography that that um, make their section of the world special. And you know, bring that back and, and share it with the uh, with the society, but also to try and promote international understanding of of Canada and Canada's culture and Canada's geography with people that we meet around the world. So that's something I really enjoy. So um, you know, basically traveling with you know through these remote areas of you know, whether it's Greece or Turkey or Iran or or you know Oman or wherever, and people say, "Wow, you're." Your license plate says British Columbia. Is that part of England? And you're like, no, that's actually part of Canada. <laughs> and let me let me tell you a little bit Perfect. about Canada. So that yeah, you know, so that's that's a lot of fun. I think you know the, you know one of the biggest challenges facing the world right now is is um, is 
is fear um, of, of people that we don't know and um, any opportunities I think that overlanders can can take to really sit down and build friendships with people from other cultures is you know it, it makes a lasting positive effect on our world I mean I you know it, it might not be as glamorous as as driving into a little village somewhere and building a school or digging a well um, but I think just the opportunity to share with other cultures and and help people recognize that it doesn't matter where you are or what language you speak or what God you pray to or what your skin color is. At the end of the day, we're all just trying to get through the day. We're just trying to, you know, survive and make it home to our families and uh, and put food on the table. And, and we're, you know, pretty much all the same. So I think that's. That's the one thing I try to stress as much as possible when we travel is to is to just let everybody that we meet know us as people and as individuals rather than as you know any type of stereotype. Anything we missed? I don't think so. No, this has been a lot of fun. So Ray, let's wrap it up with some fun facts about you. Okay. <laughs> Love the way you phrase that. What keeps your co-driver occupied on long drives? Um, so usually my co-driver is my wife Marianne, and something that she does with us, which is really cool, is is she likes to pick up books um, about the culture and history of the places we're about to visit, and as we're driving along, she'll be reading aloud to us um, so that we know what to expect. So, you know, when we were driving to the ruins of uh, Persepolis, for example, she was she was reading to us about the ancient history of Persia and Darius the Great and the condition of the ruins and when they were discovered and how they were stored. And so all of this interesting stuff so that when we get there, we all appreciate what we're seeing so much more. So that's uh, that's a lot of fun, but it's also really useful to us. But we all enjoy that. Mm-hmm. And do you play any musical instruments on the road around that campfire? Uh, no. <laughs> um, I think, you know, we're, we're, um, we like music as a family and usually we'll, we'll bring a lot of music on an iPod and, uh, and we'll listen to that when we're, when we're stopped. We can't listen to music in our vehicles when we're driving because the old Land Rovers are too noisy. You need to wear <laughs> hearing protection when you're on the road. Yep. What's your favorite drink in the morning to get you going? Oh, definitely coffee. I don't think I can really survive without a hot cup of coffee in the morning. Um, I do a lot of trips with my friend Mario Donovan, and um, and he's he's wonderful because I'll stumble out of my tent bleary-eyed in the morning, and as I'm trying to find my shoes, he usually walks up to me and says, "Good morning, Ray," and hands me a big steaming cup of coffee. Oh, and, nice. um, good friend. And he knows. He knows that I'm not really functional until I've had that morning cup of coffee. So he takes it as a personal mission to set me up for the day when we travel. So that's a lot of fun. Awesome. That's great. And what's a favorite beverage at night to wind down after a long day on the road? You know, um, I'm a I'm a tequila fan. Um, but honestly, there's nothing better than a crisp cold beer after a long dusty day on the trail. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> what is your best advice to new and aspiring overlanders like us? I would say don't think about it too much. Just go out and have fun. Drive what you got. Bring the gear that you have. Don't worry about having the right setup or the right gear or 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 don't worry about what if everything goes wrong. Everything's going to go wrong anyway. So just adapt and overcome as it goes wrong and learn from it and just have fun. Just, just basically throw some gear into the back of your truck and go and and you will slowly evolve your setup as you go but honestly don't put too much time or effort into planning the perfect setup i mean i know guys who've put 100 grand into their truck and it's still sitting in the driveway waiting until it's perfect before they go somewhere and um you know just go perfect where it's been a lot of fun how can people learn more about you and what you're doing um, well, I, I work with the Overland Rally series, and so that's uh, that's uh, in a series of events that we host every summer. So I'm always there, and uh, and then I do a lot of writing um, for Overland Journal and for the Expedition Portal and Canadian Geographic and various other websites or publications. So um, so yeah, I'm I'm usually just a Google away. Very good. And any more information you'd like to give or useful resources that our listeners should check out? 
Um, I would say the Expedition Portal website is probably the single greatest overlanding resource in the world. And not just for the resource sections in it, but because it's a genuine way to connect with real people all around the world in real time and, and learn from them. I mean, yeah. everybody out there is, is building trucks, going on trips and exploring the world and having fun, whether they're on their own or with their family. I mean, you you can find somebody on there who has the same setup as you, regardless of what it is. You want to drive to, to you know, Panama in an old Volkswagen van, somebody on that site is doing it. You want to drive your Volkswagen Touareg to the Arctic, somebody there is doing it. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a really fun way of kind of connecting with the tribe and learning um, in a genuine way. It's not it's not like a lot of resources that are driven by a particular brand. Uh, it's it's a resource which is driven by those of us who are real people in the community. Perfect. Ray, thank you so much for your time. We are humbled that you've given us such an amazing look into your world, experiences, and knowledge. Safe travels and adventures to you, and we hope to catch up with you again soon. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us, Ray. Thank you very much. Yeah, cheers. Bye. I still can't get over that story. That was great. But ladies first, Lisa, what did you think of that episode? Well, I wanted to ask Ray. I liked it. It was awesome. I can listen to Ray. It was a lot of fun. All day long. Yeah, he's a really cool guy. Um, But after we were done and let him go, I'm like, shoot, I should have asked him if he was able to grab the sandwich going through the kitchen. You're not going to hijack somebody's sandwich? Well, you're getting beat. You have a taken. knife thrown through your back. Well, no, if you just ask nicely, if they just grab a sandwich on your way by. I think you'd be in so much of all the places you're going through to get signatures from these people. A kitchen. I would just, I would, <laughs> I, I'm obviously speechless. He's brave. Sense of adventure. Absolutely. And Ray, thank you for taking your time. We do really appreciate you taking the time to share your stories, your experiences, um, just absolutely humbled that you would take the time to chat with us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things that really got me on this episode was Ray's philosophy on paying bribes. And it kind of opened my eyes a little bit. So here's what I'm thinking. There's a difference between paying a bribe from, let's say a crooked cop that pulls you over and wants say $20, you did so-and-so and you know, you didn't do it. That I'm not in favor of. I think at border crossings, a little bit different, as Ray explained, if you can hire an agent, I'm seeing that that's really no different than hiring a professional. Let's say we're in the U.S. If you want to have something done by a professional, you got to pay them for their time and experience. Or you can be stubborn and try and do it all yourself, and it'll take you a lot more time to do. You'll probably eventually get it done, but it won't be as efficient, and it'll take a lot longer. So when I tell you that we should get an agent, you'll be on board? Well, hmm. <laughs> I think it all depends on the situation, but I think Ray had a really good point. Yes. You could be super stubborn and refuse to pay him and, and bless your heart if that's what your if that's what your philosophy is, stick with it. Just be prepared that you may have to camp out at the border for a couple weeks. And you're gonna see Ray Whizzing by you. <laughs> Whizzing right by you, grabbing sandwiches in the kitchen and following some guy. And then he's going to come right back with a big smile on his face and mm, that sandwich drive is good. right past you. <laughs> so I think it's a balance. I mean, do what you feel comfortable with. Be smart. But I hadn't really thought about it in that light. And I really appreciate him bringing it up um, in that different content. Absolutely. It's a good idea to visit the show notes page on our website at ghtoverland.com slash podcasts, select the Ray Highland episode. All the details and helpful links are already there for you. Send your questions, suggestions, and feedback to ghtoverlandpodcast at gmail.com. If you have an Amazon Echo, be sure to tell Alexa, play the GHT Overland podcast my favorite way to listen to podcasts when I'm brushing my teeth in the morning. Yes, it keeps you quiet and I can hear it. (laughs) 
We'd love it if you'd connect with us on social media at GHT Overland. On the Insta, it's GHT Overland Podcast. Be sure to share this episode with your friends who enjoy travel off the beaten path. Help spread the word of the GHT Overland Podcast. We would greatly appreciate it. Overland travel is all about meeting new friends, seeing the most amazing places on earth, and of course, new food and new drinks. Do you have a favorite drink or food recipe for overlanding? We'd love to feature it and you. Send them to ghtoverlandpodcast at gmail.com. Before you race off, it would mean the world to us. If you rate and review the podcast over on iTunes and give GHT Overland a little podcast love so we could reach as many overlanders as possible. Thank you and we will see you next Thursday for a brand new episode of the GHT Overland podcast. Bye.